good morning, friends, and welcome to this weekend's digital worship service here at Westminster in Westlake Village. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, a season that invites us to intentionally slow down and to turn toward God. A lot of people will, will take time during this season to fast from something or to add some type of discipline into their regular routine, all in preparation for Holy Week and the celebration of Easter. So over the next six weeks or so here at WPC, I'm asking us to think about the way in which we live out the greatest commandment, to, to love God and love neighbor. But I want us to do more than just think about what that means, more than just think about what it means to be a, a good neighbor. So each Sunday, I'm going to invite us to, to take a Lenten challenge of sorts, to do something tangible, to remind ourselves and to remind our neighbors that, that we are called to love them. So now as we begin this morning's worship service together, will you please join me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, we, we thank you for the season of Lent. And Lord, for the reminder to, to slow down, for the reminder to, to turn toward you. Lord, as we open up your word, as we lift up one another in prayer, and as we sing songs of praise, we ask that you be with us. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.
Today's reading is from Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 to 26. My child, be attentive to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away your crooked speech, and put your devious talk far from you. And your eyes look directly forward, and your gaze be straight for you. Keep straight the path of your feet, and all your ways will be sure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So often we connect Lent to the journey that Jesus took into the wilderness before he began his public ministry and his public life. He, he took 40 days to fast and to pray. So we take 40 days, well, 46 days minus the Sundays. We know that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. But outside of that, we're, we're not really given too many details on, on what he did while he was there. I, I imagine he spent a lot of time in silence. And so during our, our time of prayer this morning, I'm going to invite us to reflect on how those days and weeks may have gone for Jesus. While, while recognizing that, that all we've gone through this past year was a bit of wilderness in itself. Let's join together in prayer. Holy God, as we enter this season, we're reminded of the days Jesus spent alone, before calling his disciples, before the miracles, before the sermons, before the conversations with the religious elite and the dinners with those on the fringes of society, before it all. Before it all, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So God, during this Lenten season, after a year where many of us spent more time alone than ever before, remind us that you know what it's like, that you've experienced isolation, frustration, doubt, temptation. God, we continue to lift up those for whom this last year has been especially difficult those who have lost loved ones, those unable to be near friends and family for whatever reason, and those who have had their lives dramatically altered because of this pandemic. As Jesus is, is tempted to find shortcuts all around success, identity, and purpose, help us be aware of the temptation that surround us each and every day. And God, help us to, to lean on you and to lean on your word just as Jesus did. At the end of the temptation story, we're told that, that angels came to attend to Jesus, to his very human needs, exhaustion, weariness, hunger, unsettledness. And we ask that you surround us in our time of need as well. So we pray all these things in the way that your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, it's so good to be back with you after being away last weekend. And I just want to take a, a quick moment to say thank you to Juan from our presbytery for being with us and to Ed and to Catherine and really the rest of the team who continue to put together this digital service each and every week. I was out in Palm Desert and it, it was good to be away for a bit. I spent most of my time reading and writing, but I also hiked a bit and, and did a fair amount of cycling as well. It had been years since I had been there. But, but during my, my second bike ride of the week, I was climbing up this, this hill, up this climb, and there was something, something familiar about it. One of those feelings where I just, I knew I had been there before, on my bike, in, in that place, but I, I couldn't quite put a finger on it. Later that night, as I was getting ready for bed, it hit me. I, I realized I was riding on a road where something fairly traumatic happened 
13 or 14 years ago, right after I started cycling. I was on a retreat in Warner Springs, which is on the other side of the mountains of, of Palm Springs and Palm Desert. And, and one of my mentors who was a pastor invited me to bring my bike on this retreat. And, and he invited me to, to go on this ride with, with him and another more experienced cyclist who's actually now a, a professor of theology. And, and, and we rode out a few miles and then up a, a little bit of a climb and then to this, this beautiful, beautiful mountaintop that looked down over the valley. It was an incredible day, beautiful. Sun was out, everything. Now we dropped down this, this steep winding road for eight or nine miles and I watched as my friends Jeff and Mason flew down the mountain in front of me. We got to the bottom of the, the hill and, and, and I could just see they had these huge smiles on their faces. I smiled too and then I asked, so how do we get back? They pointed to the road that we just came down. For, for whatever reason, I thought there was a way to get around the mountain. It was fun to go down, but going back up as we turned around and slowly started climbing. Clouds came in and, and the wind picked up. The sun disappeared and it got really, really cold. Within a few minutes, it started to rain and then frozen rain and hail. My friends stopped and waited for me and, and the, the pastor and the professor, they, they, they said, we can't go any slower. We can't stop anymore. If we do, we might get hypothermia. So here's what we'll do. We'll go get the car and we'll come back and get you. I last saw them somewhere around this turn. So I slowly started spinning up the mountain and then I got a cramp in my legs and I, I, I slowly tipped over, it was like slow motion. I unclipped from my pedals and I, I started limping up the road. Now it was getting dark and a, a car drove by and flashed its lights and then continued on its way. Minutes later, a second car came. This one actually slowed down just long enough for the person in the passenger seat to roll down their window, point at me, and yell something before speeding off again. It was pouring rain. So my mind started wandering into some, some pretty scary spaces. And then a, a third car came. It was a, a work truck of some sort, painters or something like that. They drove by me at a normal speed. Then about 100 feet in front of me, they, they put on their, their brakes. I saw the red lights. And they started backing up and, and, and coming toward me. They stopped and they got out and they made a motion for me to come and put my bike in the bed of the truck and invited me to join them in the cab. Dirty, sopping wet. They didn't care. We got to the top of the mountain and we found my friends in the convenience store. Remember the pastor and the professor, they're in a convenience store huddled around a small heater, deciding who was gonna go back and get the car and come pick me up. I'll, I'll never read the passage we are about to read the same way after that experience. And it was humbling for me to be back on that road last week. Now, this is a story that many of us know. Jesus, he's talking with a, a religious scholar, one of the experts of the law, and he asks, the expert of the law asks what he needs to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus responds, well, well, what do you think? And the scholar replies, love God and love your neighbor. But how exactly should we define neighbor? Starting at Luke chapter 10, verse 30, we read this. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper and said, Look after him, 
And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The parable of the Good Samaritan. It's one of those foundational stories for anyone who follows Jesus. Love God and love neighbor. It really is that simple. Or is it? One of the reasons that we're focusing on our our neighbors during Lent this year is that sometimes we make biblical truths that sound incredibly straightforward more complicated than they need to be. We try to justify our actions or our inaction by asking the same sort of question that the religious scholar asked Jesus. Who is my neighbor? This parable, it gives us three steps that answer both the who and the how of loving God and loving neighbor. Jesus, he he chooses his words incredibly carefully as he tells this parable. He was completely aware, fully aware of the amount of hatred that existed between the Jewish people of his day and the Samaritans. It had been gone on for for hundreds of years before him. Both sides, they they each claimed to be true and the true and rightful heirs and owners of the land. And everything that was wrong with the world was the fault of the people who stood on the other side of the aisle. Now, the road that Jesus refers to in this parable, it was incredibly dangerous. Everybody knew it. So the expert in the law wouldn't have been surprised at all to hear a story about a man getting beaten up as as he traveled on it. He he probably would have been nodding his head along as Jesus told the story and and would have said or thought, of course, of course, that, that man, he shouldn't have been on that road in the first place. The priest passes by. Then the Levite passes the beaten man. Two people who the expert would have expected to stop, but they don't. And then the Samaritan, the bitter, bitter enemy, he stops. And he takes these three steps. He takes three steps that teach us how to be a neighbor. First, he saw the beaten man. He noticed him. Now, so many of us today, we are creatures of habit, especially when it comes to the places where we live. We shop at the same grocery stores. We we go to the same offices. We we eat at the same restaurants. We have our our favorite parks and our favorite beaches, and we drive the same routes to and from those places. Now, years ago, before our family moved to the Conejo Valley, and we were just kind of getting settled and adjusting to a new place, I got lost all the time. But now, over three years later, I just kind of wander around on autopilot because I know the roads. It's so easy to be lulled to sleep by the familiarity and routines we're in. And when we get to that place, we run the risk of missing our neighbors. But taking notice, it's not enough. It's only the first step. The priest and the Levite, they probably noticed the man on the road. Maybe out of the the corner of their eye they saw him, or maybe they actually turned and they gave him a a quick glance and, and once They made eye contact. They realized how uncomfortable it was and they continue on their way. So they just just look away and they they continue on. And, And that's what set the Samaritan apart. He stopped, but he didn't just stop. He went to the beaten man. He listened. The Samaritan didn't stand on the other side of the street and shout, hey, Hey, you over there, do you need anything? Nor did he walk by as fast as he could and just kind of drop money at the man's feet and continue on his way. He went to him. Now, when I was sitting on the side of the road in the pouring rain with my bike, the first two cars saw me. One even honked, slowed down and honked and pointed. But the work truck was the only one that stopped and came to me. My dad, he's a a fantastic neighbor. I'm sure I'll write a story or two about him in the the daily reflections um, we're sending out during Lent around neighboring. Growing up, he would often come home from work 
and go on a run somewhere in our neighborhood. When he'd get back, he'd have two or three or four stories about our neighbors. Eventually, the the joke in our family was that he wasn't even out running, that he would just come home from work, that he would put on his running clothes and go and talk with the neighbor. He, He learned their names. He knew their stories. So during the beginning of our service, I mentioned that uh, during Lent, I was going to encourage us to take up a challenge each and every week, all around what it means to be a good neighbor. So, So this week, I want us to start with something simple. I want to encourage you to take five minutes today, just five minutes, and list out as many of your neighbor's names as you can think of. How many do you know? Five, 10, 15? Literally, take some time and write them down. Now, if you want to go a step further, do you really know their stories, where they're from, how they ended up in your neighborhood, what they do for a living or what they they did for a living? What do they do for fun? If you can write down two or three facts about your neighbors, do it. Now, I know this might feel kind of funny at first, but if we are going to take Jesus's command to love God and love neighbors seriously, we have to actually know our neighbors. Then the the Samaritan, he he showed the beaten man grace. He took care of his needs. Now, so often we think of acts of grace as kind of these big sweeping actions. And sometimes they are. Things like paying an innkeeper for a few days stay. But they can also be small, everyday acts. It can be talking to a neighbor who you know is alone. It could be a conversation with with the kid who always skateboards in front of your house or even on your driveway and expects you to come out and and yell at him instead of asking him his name. It it could be asking the clerk at the grocery store or the barista at your coffee shop how they're doing and then paying close enough attention to look them in the eyes and listen to their response, hearing their story. This parable reminds us that we don't always get to choose our neighbors. It's whoever we find on our path. And so much of what Jesus modeled in his life and in his ministry, it starts with these small moments of grace, a seemingly insignificant conversation with a Samaritan woman at the well. Sitting down for meals with people that he shouldn't have been with according to the rest of the culture and giving those people his full attention being interrupted by children during his sermon, all seemingly small acts, small moments of grace. Love God, love neighbor. Four words that sound so simple, but remain nothing more than a good idea if we don't keep them in front of us at all times and if we are not intentional. So what does it look like for WPC to be a community of people who who slow down and notice our neighbors, who don't just navigate the world on on autopilot, who actually stop and listen to the stories of our neighbors, and who show small acts of kindness, extending grace each and every day. Now, I imagine if if we did those things and continue to do those things, the Conejo Valley, our neighborhoods, our communities, they, they might look a little different that we'd feel less isolated than we do right now, and it's something we we really need, our world desperately needs that. And that we'd see the people we encounter move from stranger to acquaintance to neighbor. Amen. Praise God from whom Good morning, everyone. Catherine here with this week's Life Together. 
I hope you all enjoyed joining us for our Mardi Gras celebration and Ash Wednesday from home with your take home ashes, Mardi Gras boxes and scripture. We have a lot of exciting events and programs coming up over the next month as we journey through Lent. Here are a few things coming up soon. This afternoon, our middle school girls group will be meeting here in the courtyard at WPC from 2.30 to 4 p.m. The group will be led by one of our young adults, Hannah Rudder, and one of our wonderful adult volunteers, Terry Kupfer. And they'll gather outdoors, socially distanced, for an afternoon, getting to know each other, doing some crafts and activities, enjoying some snacks, and just kind of hanging out. We would love to see anyone in grades six through eight there. Our Kids Fellowship Club KFC registration is live. Our theme for KFC is three, two, one, reach. And we will be meeting for four Tuesdays throughout the month of March as a hybrid of in-person and online through Zoom. Elementary age children in grades K through fifth are invited to join us. And our middle school and high schoolers are welcome to participate as student leaders. Registration for our participants and our student leaders is both live. We hope to see you there. Speaking of our KFC student leaders, next Thursday, January 25th at 4 p.m. here at WPC, we'll be hosting a student leader training where our middle and high school students will learn about what leading KFC will be like. The wonderful Kevin Robertson and Scott Bradley will be walking through different scenarios with our leaders and they'll learn a little bit more about what KFC will look like this year. We'll have pizza and snacks and it should be a fun time. Feel free to email myself if you plan on joining us. Also this coming Thursday, January 25th at 6 p.m., we'll have our second dinner and a movie Zoom conversation talking about the movie Green Book. Green Book is a story of a working class Italian American bouncer who becomes the driver of an African American classical pianist on a tour of venues through the 1960s American South. We invite you to register online to join us and watch the movie on your own prior to the 25th. We hope to see you there. And as always, we're grateful for the support that our WPC congregants continue to give through all of the ups and downs of life. You are welcome to send your offering for today in through our website at wpcwestlake.org. You can text WPC Give to 77977, and you're always welcome to mail a check here into the office. And now as we conclude our service, let's join together in our closing hymn.
Four words, love God, love neighbor. Three steps, slow down, stop and listen, and show grace. Let's take some time as a community during Lent to focus on the act of neighboring. And remember our, our challenge this week is to, to make a list of our neighbors. Who do we know? How well do we know them? How well do we know their story? The reality is we can't love people who we don't know. So let's get to know our neighbors and now receive this morning's benediction. Go out with the love of God the Father, with the grace offered by Jesus Christ, God's only Son, and with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.